Hot Springs is known for being innovative, groundbreaking, and a leader. That includes district court. The late Judge David Schweitzer had a vision for court that continued with his daughter, Meredith Schweitzer, and now on to Judge Joe Graham, who is with us today to update us on the status of district court. Welcome, Judge Graham. Thank you, Terry. And let me be the first, to, or probably not the first, to thank you for your 29 years of service, and we hate to lose you coming up pretty soon. Thank you. That's very nice. I appreciate that. So speaking of uh, time served, tell us how long that you have been uh, as District 1, uh, or Division 1, rather, judge of District Court. Been a little less than three months right now. Okay, just mm -hmm. three months just in. Three months. Very good. So I know everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> and your prior experience was as? Uh, prosecuting attorney. I was the chief deputy prosecutor for the last few years. So I've been a prosecutor for 20 years prior to taking the bench in January. And it's a little different mindset being on the judge's bench? It's a little bit different as far as a prosecutor, like we always talk about, our main duty is to do justice. It's the only attorney that has that certain ethical calling to do justice. Every other attorney is meant to just uh, take their client's position and advocate as best they can. Uh, so there was a certain element of having to do what was right as opposed to just seeking convictions. But when it came to the point in time where you decided this is uh, the right thing to do, then you did become an advocate. So you're advocating one side versus the other. And it's a little different perspective being the judge who's taking the prosecutor and them advocating their position and the defense attorney advocating their position and being the one to make that ultimate decision. I see. Um, let's talk a little bit about the specialty courts, which, you know, um, David Ju uh, Judge David Schweitzer actually initiated. Um, he had that vision, and they've continued to grow because of the needs of, of the local population. Uh, mental health court, drug court, and veterans court. You know, two of those courts are, are active under your direction, your leadership. Um, how, is, how is the um, veterans court going, for example? Um, and also, can you update us on the mental health court? Well, Judge Ohm does the drug court, and I handle the DWI and veterans court. Uh, we believe the Veterans Court's doing some very good work. There, uh, some of these transformations that you see uh, when uh, we owe a lot to our veterans is what I've always said. Uh, and a lot of the times the trouble that they have that brings them into district court uh, is directly attributable to uh, what they saw overseas, what their service, uh, uh, certain things they've done has affected them. Uh, so we think we owe them a huge debt. And some of these people, when they get the treatment that they need, uh, just the transformation is amazing. Um, on the DWI court, uh, we're doing very good work as well. Um, we looked at the mental health court, and we've kind of started doing a mental health court at this point in time. We've integrated it with the DWI court and with the veterans court. It is, uh, uh, when I started looking, we were really looking at establishing the mental health court and kind of had the end in mind about a big program. Uh, but when doing the DWI and Veterans Court, as you probably well know, there are so many people that have a dual diagnosis. Uh, people who have alcohol uh, issues, uh, a lot of times, you know, maybe mental health contributed to their alcohol issues, or at the very least, their alcohol issues have led to some sort of depression or some sort of mental illness. Uh, Mental, mental thing that we need to deal with. So we were dealing with uh, so many of those people anyway. Uh, before DWI court and veterans court, we have a staffing where we have everyone who's given services to our uh, participants come in and we talk about them. How are they doing? What can we do to make them better? Uh, uh, what can we do for them? And when we started looking at it, we were dealing with a lot of people anyway who were having mental health issues uh, that were either showing itself in alcohol and substance abuse or or vice versa. So, and when we looked out across the room, we had the people from Quapaw, Watchtaw Behavioral Health, other treatment providers out here already. So it was like, we're kind of looking at a big mental health court to start, but it was like Judge Schweitzer, we were already doing it. You know, we were already addressing some mental health issues and we had the providers in the room. So we decided just to expand it and uh, start taking more people into that program. Uh, who have mental health issues since we have everybody there, all the resources provided. It just makes sense to consolidate those people on one docket to where you have the treatment providers in the same room and you can uh, address and hopefully give them some help. 
So when you're speaking of treatment providers, we, how would you say, um, how would you assess the resources that we have in the Hot Springs area? I mean, they've got to take their time um, to come to court and be available for um, some of the individuals that you see, the offenders that, uh, as you say, have mental health issues perhaps mixed in with other issues. Um, how are those um, agencies serving the needs of, of Hot Springs? We're very lucky to have some very good providers in Hot Springs. Uh, I know Quapaw, they handle, they have an inpatient program, they have an outpatient program, they have classes uh, for mental health and substance abuse. So it's kind of a one-stop shop that we try to take advantage of as much as we can. Uh, Watch Child Behavior Health and Wellness can have access to a, a residential program, but mainly they're in the outpatient business of providing services. Uh, and, and they do a great job. Uh, as far as the substance abuse aspect of it, we have several local providers I know uh, who do inpatient programs and do a great work. Uh, we also have those that provide outpatient programs and some life skills like uh, the CCMC is doing some good work as far as doing classes at the jail in the Getting Out While Getting Ahead program. And the same program takes place for people who aren't in jail. They call it Bridges Out of Poverty and they're doing very good work and provide the medical services and other services that they need. And Lynn Blankenship was just named the nonprofit executive of the year for the whole state of Arkansas. Isn't that amazing? It is. So we have great resources here in town, but we also have resources outside of town. And sometimes uh, in the experience that I've seen, it, it can be helpful for certain people to go elsewhere for treatment. Uh, we've seen some people who you know might go to a local facility and just walk off. It's easy to walk off. You can walk back to where you were and right back into the same problems you were to where uh, I know we have a harbor house. We've had some good fortune with them and they're in Conway. And uh, it's not as easy to walk back to Hot Springs from Conway, so it's not as easy to walk off unless someone's picking you up. So uh, some people we've actually made the conscious decision, let's get them out of town, uh, try to get them away from their adverse influences. And, Hopefully that'll help their sobriety. Break the cycle, in yes. other words. Yeah. It's, you know, as far as treatment, it's, I always tell people, you know, while they're in treatment, it's good, but, you know, if you go back to your same friends, uh, the same other people who are probably using controlled substances, using alcohol the same way you were before, to expect that you're going to be strong enough to resist the influence uh, is probably not reasonable. Mm -hmm. And you would say we do have considerable problems here in Hot Springs with all of the things that you mentioned that cause us to have specialty courts. Do you see a lot of, of problems? We do, and uh, I don't think we're uh, alone in that. I think it's uh, everywhere at this point in time. But, uh, yes. but we do have a lot of great uh, programs here inside the city and outside the city we have access to. Well, and that's certainly a great thing. Now, uh, technically, your position is part-time. That is going to change in 2021 due to state law. Can you tell us why and how? Well, uh, there was an amendment that was passed several years ago uh, that was implementing uh, making all the district judges full-time. Uh, prior to that, there was really no connection between district court and circuit court. Uh, most of the district courts and circuit courts work together. We work well with our circuit court. Uh, all the first appearances happen in this court unless they're direct filed into circuit court. So everyone kind of starts here anyway, and we keep track. They have 60 days if they've been arrested and they're in jail for the prosecutor's office to make the determination if they're going to file it as a felony or leave it as a misdemeanor here in district court. So we put them on the docket and we try to keep that time frame in mind, uh, let everybody know, hey, that time frame's coming up, you need to make a decision uh, to make sure that our, I know everybody knows the legal system runs kind of slowly, but there are time frames that we have to keep in mind. So, um, so we work well together, but we're not really one unit. So they passed this amendment several years ago to try to uh, streamline all the district courts, uh, get them in lines with the circuit court. Uh, it is part-time now, but I don't have a private practice, so I'm here pretty much every day, all day. to, uh, And it's been beneficial, I think, to the office for me to be able to sign warrants when they come up. Uh, police officers may need a warrant signed, the other judge on the bench may not be a judge here other than me, uh, and I think it's beneficial. Um, the other districts, they've kind of done this incrementally. Other district courts have already been moved to full-time throughout the state. Uh, 
there's some things that the Supreme Court said that the district court can do for the circuit court to help alleviate their problems. Um, mental and alcohol commitments, uh, child support cases, uncontested divorces are some of the things that uh, other district courts are handling for circuit courts across the state. Uh, what'll have to happen is after 2021, we'll have a meeting with all the judges, the circuit judges and the district judges, uh, and we'll come up with some sort of breakdown as far as what we can do to help them with, with their issues at that point in time. So to, as far as the public sees, is there going to be that big of a change when the court goes from part-time to full-time? Will they notice the difference? Some people will, probably not most people. Uh, the regular district court will still be pretty much the same. It's just we'll have more duties that circuit court normally handles now. Uh, so those people who would normally go to circuit court for those problems will be coming down to district court. Those people will notice, but probably the general public uh, won't necessarily notice the expanded role. Right. It's not as though uh, an individual that comes in here for their particular offense sticks around to see what the whole day is like or, you know, how heavy the, the uh, flow of cases is. The, um, the subject of treatment, let's return to that for a moment and, um, and ask you why is, is treatment a better alternative than jail time? Obviously, you have to consider both for um, many of the individuals that come before you. Sometimes treatment isn't a better alternative than jail time. It just depends upon the particular defendant, and that is the uh, probably the most challenging aspect of the job. Uh, most of the decisions I make are easy as far as guilt or innocence. Uh, uh, it's the sentencing that that really comes into play, and taking some time to talk to that particular defendant. Uh, by and large, the most most of the people we deal with in district court are people who uh, are speeding one time or they forget to put their new proof of insurance in their car and, and don't provide it. And those are people who will we'll see one time and will never see again. So obviously you don't have to spend much time with those people. Uh, the other people, when they start coming in on a regular basis, it's, uh, uh, well, we need to see what, what the problem is. Is there an underlying substance abuse? Is there an underlying alcohol problem, underlying mental problem that causes this person to keep coming back and back? And what can we do to address that problem because that's the ultimate goal is, you know, we don't want to see them back in front of us anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so that can be the, the challenging part, figuring out where they are. And some people are just, you know, for lack of a better term, they're just bad people. It's not because of a mental problem. It's not because of a drug or alcohol problem. It's just, and those people are the people that need to be in jail. And, and we have to deal with those people as well. Now that you're a whole three months in, um, is it what you expected? For the most part, uh, dealing with the criminal justice side, but I've been doing murders and rapes almost exclusively for uh, the last several years, so I didn't deal in district court as much. Um, but for the most part, uh, obviously in dealing with the more serious violent felonies and sexual felonies, uh, treatment aspects aren't really a concern so that's been uh, more of an adjustment to uh, to deal with the treatment as well when you get to murders and rapes you're talking more about you know jail time penitentiary time and, and how much they're up but uh, uh, so if it's more of a grassroots more of a trying to address problems uh, situation and trying to discern between the people who you can help and you can't help and that that's always a a, a subjective decision and something you can really second guess yourself about on a lot of occasions. Now in your former work you might have to prepare prepare for trial over the weekend's time. What are your weekends like now as district judge? Uh, every six weeks we have to do jail duty. All the, the four circuit judges and the two district judges rotate. Uh, that just entails on a Saturday going to the jail making sure everybody's had a probable cause determination. Anybody who needs to be seen by a judge can be seen by a judge. Uh, but we do inmates Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays here in this court trying to make sure that we get people in front of the judge within 72 hours as is required. Uh, mainly the Saturday is to get those people who may have done something on Friday that they won't be able to see by a judge or a determination made till Monday. We want to make sure we don't uh, mess up the time frames at all. So a probable cause determination has to be made within 48 hours. So we need something to happen on Saturday for those that uh, are arrested on Friday that don't get in front of the judge before then. So um, 
And then, of course, we're always kind of on call. Most of the police officers, detectives have my cell phone number. If they have a search warrant on the weekends, uh, overnight, uh, then they can call, uh, come out to my house as they've done before. And I'll read the search warrant, and decide if there's probable cause, and sign the search warrant if there is, or, or, or tell them where it's lacking if it's not. Uh, luckily, I figured there'd be more of that with my relationship with law enforcement from the past uh, several years of being here, but uh, knock on wood, luckily it hasn't been as often. I know my wife's real happy about that too. That's good. Well then, what is the most challenging part of the job? I think the most challenging part of the job is the sentencing of the particular defendants, uh, certain defendants, like I said, your, your normal one-time users of district court, that's, that's not an issue. The uh, trying to figure out the repeat offenders, uh, why they keep coming back, and is there a way to, uh, to keep them from coming back. Uh, it's an inexact science, to say the least, and it's, it's the part where you can really second guess yourself. Uh, and obviously, you know, in dealing with some of the people that we deal with, if, if they see, you know, a couple come up that say they need drug or alcohol treatment and they get drug or alcohol treatment and don't go to jail, then they can be like, well, that's, I see my way out of this deal. I'll tell them. Uh, as I tell most people, though, if I send somebody to treatment and it doesn't work out, if they're not committed to it, they don't comply, then obviously they're back in front of me before a certain amount of time and they'll get uh, the punishment that's right for them. It just may be a little bit delayed from when it normally would have been. Must be an interesting combination of a lot of qualities, instinct, intuition, experience. A lot of things come to bear in those decisions that you have to make. It is, and, and still, uh, you know, it, when it comes down to it, it's, it's the way I feel at that point in time. And you know, that may not be the way another judge would feel with that same person and the same facts in front of them at that time. So it's, uh, uh, you know, we have standard fines as far as if you do this once or do it twice or uh, kind of standard penalties. But, you know, at, at that point in time when you're making that determination, uh, it's all about the, that particular judge on that particular day. And, you know, there could be 20 other judges who decide that case and they may decide it 20 different ways. It's uh, uh, hopefully we just try to do the right thing all the time and not what's popular. Well, a lot of good work happens every day here at District Court, and we certainly commend your staff who um, uh, handle an amazing amount of cases. Uh, they have to work with many other agencies as well, and I know they're your, your support system. <coughs> they, uh, this job would be uh, just uh, insurmountable if it wasn't for Vicki Asher and Mark Allen. and. Uh, our district court clerk and administrator and the great job that they do having me prepared. Uh, basically, uh, when I make a decision, it, it's going to be based upon information. And that information comes from Vicki and the staff and Mark as well. They, uh, they go out of their way to make sure if we're dealing with a sentencing, we know exactly what this person's done in the past, uh, what their ramifications have been in the past, if they've been to a treatment program, if they, all of that stuff is written on our dockets to where uh, we don't have to go searching for the information, so it's all there. Uh, just the sheer volume that we deal with in district court, the number of people, if you've ever been to district court to see coming through, uh, obviously uh, it would be a better situation in some ways if we could spend a lot of time on one particular defendant, but obviously we can't just based upon the numbers. Uh, so. Uh, having all that information at our fingertips where we don't have to go reaching for it, we don't have to go researching it, is just, they're unbelievable, I don't know. Uh, they make me look good, and that's a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> and now you know the backside mm -hmm. of every case. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. Judge, thank you so much for spending time with us today and uh, allowing the public to get to know you a little bit better in your new role here um, in district court. We appreciate very much the, the service that you provide to our community every single day. And thank you for your service again for 29 wonderful years, Terry. I appreciate that. And next week, we'll bring you more city news. <laughs>